um, kia ora, I'm Fredrika, and my project this summer centered on the history of Auckland's queer communities. But before I get into this presentation, I'd just like to thank the Auckland Library Heritage Trust for funding this project, uh, as well as the archivists here who helped me with various collections, including the Auckland Lesbian Archives, the Auckland Library's Heritage Images, and the Queer Stories Oral History Collection. Queer history as a whole is a new area of study. It has only gained prominence within the last few decades, in parallel with the growing acceptance of queer communities in Auckland and New Zealand. Yet queer people existed in the city well before the legislative and social changes of the late 20th century, the most significant of which was the Homosexual Law Reform Act in 1986. While queer people existed before such developments, they were for the most part hidden. And the question that naturally arises is where? This question led me to the topic of my project, which is queer spaces in the three decades leading up to homosexual law reform. These spaces are a physical testament to how queer people made their mark on Auckland at this time, existing as vibrant and inclusive enclaves in a city that otherwise suppressed its queer population. Queer, sa queer spaces became host to the parallel lives of Auckland's queer communities. Yet these spaces also gained an agency of their own, shaping the culture and character of their occupants. Auckland was home to three distinct forms of queer parallel spaces throughout the period in question, which give rise to the three strands or parallel lives that this presentation weaves together. The first is a network of private houses, including the Hearn Bay House on the left, in which queer Aucklanders lived and socialised. Exclusively queer flats were established out of necessity, but quickly became a cultural phenomenon and the diverse lives led within them speak to the diversity of queer Aucklanders. They house everything from large scale communal living experiments to queer families and everyday people living their lives. The quintessential queer spaces, however, are public ones, especially the inner city bars and clubs which punctuated Auckland's nightlife from the 1970s. Yet queer public spaces existed as early as the 1950s as well, and were never limited to bars. As the central photo of construction at this lesbian Snapdragon bookshop illustrates, queer establishments were just as varied as private homes. Thirdly, I also consider queer people in mainstream areas of Auckland. It is well established that these spaces were not welcoming for queer communities. And yet despite this, queer people carved out space for themselves in the city, whether through building connections with friends and co-workers or by reclaiming the streets of Auckland in events like the one advertised in the poster on the right. With respect to private spaces, firstly, housing insecurity was a central issue for queer communities during this period. In addition to the very real risk of being rejected by family members and thus left homeless, section 146 of the 1961 Crimes Act gave landlords a legal incentive to evict queer tenants. This clause, which outlined pen penalties of up to 10 years imprisonment for keeping a resort for homosexual acts was only repealed in 1986. Before this, it was thus not uncommon for queer people to take advantage of transitional housing arrangements. A typical example is the Youth Line Hostel in Mount Albert, which was established by academic, former Catholic priest and Youth Line founder Felix Donnelly and explicitly welcomed queer youth. Living in an accepting and affirming environment like this was a pivotal experience for many people, with David Russell, who later became a prominent gay activist, recalling that Felix Donnelly's place helped me to come to terms with my sexuality. Flatting, however, became the most widespread living situation for Auckland's queer communities. While it was fairly common for queer couples to live together in the 1950s, the growing collective consciousness of gay and lesbian communities in the 1970s gave rise to a well-connected network of queer flats in the central suburbs of Ponsonby, Grafton, Hearn Bay, and Grey Lynn. Or more accurately, two networks. The consistent division between gay and lesbian households reflected the belief at the time that homosexual men and women strive for different things, as one woman, Sandy, expressed it. So what was it like? to live in one of these queer homes. Both images here 
relate to one well-known, if slightly unusual, flat. Early in 1982, 10 women and one of their children moved into this house on Wallace Street in Hearn Bay. They attempted the communal thing in larger style, as it was described. That is, to actualize a lesbian feminist vision of shared resources, communal living, and political activity. Household tasks were rostered, childcare was divided equally, and the flat became a hub for Auckland lesbians. Over the following years, people gathered at Wallace Street for everything from astrology workshops to garage sales and meetings on queer unemployment. In this respect, the Wallace Street House hints at a wider theme of this presentation. Private homes did not lock queer communities behind closed doors. More often than not, in fact, their doors were wide open. Auckland's queer homes were a social venue as early as the 1950s. As one gay man, Billy Farnell, recalled in a later interview, gay people went to each other's homes. That was the crux of the whole thing. This took the form of house parties, with couples taking turns to host, play music, and outdo their friends with elaborate baking. When queer venues emerged in Auckland, these homes became, if anything, even more public. Households often frequented bars and clubs as a group. For instance, a 1983 House Antics evening held at the Lesbian KG Club and pictured on this slide featured flat performances. Whanganui Avenue offered a synchronized dancing routine, Paget Street a musical drama, and Franklin Road, whose residents planned the event, sang together. This leads me to the public spaces of Auckland's queer communities. Informal queer dominated venues existed as early as the 1950s, including the Cardoro Coffee Bar on Custom Street and the Lily Pond at the nearby Great Northern Hotel, which is shown on the left of the slides. Both significantly were located near the wharf, an area frequented by merchant sailors who often spent their time in Auckland engaged in social or sexual encounters with the city's gay men. These sailors were also a significant influence on the character of early queer public spaces. Les Mack, for instance, remembers the excitement at the lily pond when a transistor radio was brought in from a ship, enabling wireless music to be played for the first time. From the end of six o'clock closing in 1967, dedicated venues by and for queer communities began to replace these informal spaces. The likes of Elfie's Bar, the Aquarius Society, and the Staircase Club transformed Auckland, as one man put it, into party central. Yet these were far more than just places to dance. As businesses, they also employed gay people and provided an audience for queer entertainers. And the business angle of gay spaces was also their most significant difference from lesbian equivalents like the KG Club. The latter was a community project where all work was voluntary, with the singularly feminist exception that two cleaners were paid. As the main center for Auckland lesbians, the KG Club also had a wider range of functions than individual gay establishments. In its decade and a half long lifespan, it functions as everything from a dance hall to a softball training gym, a movie theater, and occasionally even a wedding venue. Yet gay and lesbian spaces alike faced significant challenges. While liquor laws had been relaxed somewhat in the late 1960s, they remained convoluted. And this meant that police raids on bars and clubs were not uncommon. And those on queer spaces were particularly likely to escalate. When, as at a 1976 raid on the backstage club, police made derogatory re remarks about queer communities. Such raids could also have significant consequences. Backstage's manager, Lou Prime, was fined $75, a significant amount at the time, while two years later, the KG Club permanently closed its Beach Road premises after a similar raid. This discrepancy reflects the fact that the KG Club, like many queer spaces, also faced financial issues. In 1979, the club was $3,800 in debt, which was an even larger amount, while its weekly profit was a mere $70. Attempts to ameliorate financial difficulties through government support, moreover, revealed further difficulties. When the Lesbian Snapdragon Bookshop was in a similar financial situation, its funding applications were initially declined on the grounds that lesbians were not a, quote, disadvantaged group. Queer public spaces thus either had to become self-sufficient 
as the image of Snapdragon's renovations illustrates, or to rely on each other, as the KG Club did when it accepted financial assistance from the Gay Aquarius Society. The most transformative challenge to queer public spaces came, in fact, from within, through groups of queer people who felt unwelcome in these establishments. Much of this exclusion stemmed from a fear of heterosexuality entering queer spaces. In particular, bisexual and transsexual people were ostracized by some queer Aucklanders for, I quote, parodying their struggles while remaining heterosexual. Other access issues were practical, such as minors being unable to enter clubs like the Aquarius. Yet these seemingly practical issues also had an ideological basis. In the case of lesbian mothers, the ostensible problem was the, a lack of childcare in queer spaces. Yet this itself was the product of an underlying anxiety around male and non-queer children entering these spaces for fear that they were, as the KG Club committee put it, potential women oppressors. From the late 1970s, such gatekeeping in queer public spaces was, however, challenged. A mass walkout at the lesbian-owned Alexandra Tavern, which is shown on the right uh, and had been accused of racism towards Māori and Pacific patrons, began a five-year-long boycott by marginalised members of Auckland's queer communities. Yet in many cases, these doubly marginalised groups successfully challenged, improved, and finally re-entered Auckland's queer establishments. By 1983, for instance, lesbian mothers held a disco at the KG Club, where their children were not only tolerated, but explicitly invited. Queer public spaces thus responded to and grew with the evolving needs of Auckland's queer communities. Alongside private and public spaces of their own, queer communities also occupied the streets of Auckland. Mainstream areas of the city may not have welcomed them, but some queer people were able to transcend this and live relatively openly in Auckland. In the 1950s and 1960s, this was primarily enabled by strong personal relationships between queer and non-queer people. After 1972, however, everything changed dramatically. In March, the country's gay liberation movement was unexpectedly founded at the University of Auckland, with a speech by activist Nahuya Te Awe Kotuku, who was pictured. This catalyzed the formation of Auckland's Gay Liberation Front, which weeks later organized New Zealand's first gay happening in Albert Park. A Gay Pride Week, a poster for which is shown, followed the next year in 1973. This part of the story, like the various campaigns for homosexual law reform over the following decade, is well known and best summarized by a participant at the time. We're coming out, out of the closets and into the streets. At this stage, I'd like to problematize the premise of this talk, which was that queer people lived parallel lives in Auckland's private, public, and mainstream spaces. The fact is that mainstream spaces, from the emergence of gay liberation onwards, were the site where these parallel lives intersected. Queer private and public spaces had been involved in political activism from the outset. Early activities of the Gay Liberation Front were organized in private properties in Remuera and Parnell. As the organization outgrew these spaces, public venues provided a ready alternative. In 1985, for instance, queer people getting involved with the homosexual law reform campaign were directed to the Snapdragon Bookshop to collect a list of members of parliament that the campaign wished to lobby, while a rally in the town hall in the same year was followed by an after party at the KG Club. The parallel lives of queer Aucklanders thus converged when various forms of queer spaces began to interact. Yet the quote on this slide hints at a second form that this convergence took. Bernie Sheehan, an active member of Auckland's lesbian community, had this to say about queer political activism. Marches are such a social occasion, good for catching up on gossip, in between kicking policemen in the shins and chatting between the chanting. Indeed, by the 1980s, queer marches like the one pictured could include music, dancing, and costumes. And if this sounds familiar, it's certainly not a coincidence. The celebratory culture, which had underpinned queer house parties from the 1950s and become institutionalized in queer bars and clubs during the 1970s, had made its way onto the streets of Auckland. <laughs> <laughs> 
The celebratory marches of gay liberation are likely also familiar in another sense. They were the precursors of pride parades like the one that Auckland celebrated just last week, 50 years after the city's first gay pride week. It is thus possible to argue that the private and public spaces of queer communities, which are featured throughout my project, despite their decline following homosexual law reform in 1986, still survive. These spaces not only set the stage for subsequent generations of queer bars and clubs, they also fostered the culture of queer communities. And when they united around political activism, they introduced this culture to the streets of Auckland. Queer spaces, private, public, and mainstream, are this one reason that the vast majority of queer Aucklanders today no longer need to live parallel lives.